Welcome to the Central Library's educational platform for the presentation of research and ideas in support of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. Today's library seminar is titled State Space Stock Assessment Models, Previous Applications, Future Potential. The presentation is part of the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series, which is developed by NOAA Fisheries and organized by Kristen Blackheart. Today's speaker, Emily Lilgestrand, will be introduced by Kristen. Before I hand over the mic, though, here are just a few housekeeping items for your consideration. If you have trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, we suggest that you log out and rejoin us. This resets the software and usually resolves most technical issues. Our presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. We are very interested in your questions and we encourage you to ask them throughout the seminar even though the speaker will not address them until the end of her presentation. All audience members are muted, so type your questions or comments in the chat box under questions located in the control panel of GoToWebinar. And to our live audience participants, we encourage you to fill out the quick survey at the end of this webinar. The library is very interested in knowing uh, what you wanna tune into in the future. So that last detail, let's get started. The mic's yours, Kristen. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so our speaker today is a very ambitious student who has offered to share some of her research with us. Emily triple majored um, in ecology, biochemistry, and Asian studies at Rice University, and then went on to receive her master's degree in fishery science from the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science where she studied the mortality and movement dynamics of Atlantic Menhaden at the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. Um, now, Emily is pursuing her PhD at Michigan State University in the Quantitative Fisheries Center, where she is under the guidance of Dr. Jim Bentz and is also a NIMS Grant Joint Fellow under the mentorship of um, some shady characters. Um, she is broadly interested in population dynamics and stock assessment modeling and how alternative model design can influence accuracy and precision and how to quantify these qualities. Um, interesting fact, she holds a second degree black belt in Taekwondo and has also worked as an EMT. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Emily to tell us about state 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 space models well thank you very much Kristen. i don't know you know what disreputable sources you you dug into to find all of those accurate facts that, <laughs> about me um probably from my personal website but uh yes thank you so much for for having me for this series uh thank you everyone who's decided to tune in today um ahead of a, a busy and hopefully um really good three-day weekend so um Thanks, Kristen and Lisa. Um, but also at the the top of my presentation, I just want to make a nod to thank you to my funding sources, um, my my research group, the Quantitative Fishery Center at Michigan State University, my advisor Jim Bentz, um, and my mentors, the the shady, disreputable fellows that she mentioned, uh, John Darova and and colleagues and others at um, the Northeast Fishery Science Center. So, um, without further ado, I'll I'll jump into it. So. Uh, today's topic is about um, state space stock assessment models, um, sort of the application in the past and some future potential. And um, a brief presentation outline. Um, first, I will kind of explain what is a state space stock assessment model, what makes them different from our, our contemporary um, stock assessment modeling. Um, I will kind of um, cage this in and like the kind of the history of state space stock assessment models and sort of explain how their development um has, has proceeded over the last 40 or so years into into what it is today and kind of the contemporary pursuits that um uh are taking place um in this field and and finally i'll, I'll bring it back to my own work and my own um little specific corner of of this really quite broad and and ever expanding um the state-based assessment modeling world um so in order to best explain what makes a state-based model um, or state-based stock assessment model, it's important first to kind of explain um, to those who may not know what, what a, um, a statistical estimation model is in, um, in stock assessment. So um, sort of you know, oversimplify it and just kind of broad strokes, 
um, an estimation model as opposed to something like a simulation or forecasting or broadcasting model um, takes in existing information about about the fisheries the the catch how many of kinds of individuals are caught in different areas at different times um, and also information from possibly fisheries independent surveys um, things like independent indices of abundance um, all this information gets read into um, our stock assessment model which um, has usually two kind of sub models one that attempts to explain what's going on with the the fish population itself you know how many are um, how many are being born how many are dying in each year um, but also the the sub model that um, kind of explains how we got the the data that we got so based on you know the fishing activity and the fishing effort how we ended up seeing um, the sort of catch and survey metrics or data that we get um, and ultimately, the goal is to um, estimate these, these parameters or uh, generate other output to sort of um, find the best set of uh, parameters that best explain um, what we're observing um, in this data. And uh, almost all stock assessment models have these sort of sub, the process or population model and this observation or fisheries model. Um, and both of these sub models are uh, inherently are sort of variable and inherently can be subject to some kinds of error. And so in particular, the, the process model will have what we call process variation. So um, if you think about some of those values I was talking about, you know, how, how many individuals are born, how many individuals uh, die, these sort of underlying population metrics, things like the recruitment, natural mortality, fishing mortality, and selectivity, and, and other values, um, these will vary across time, um, across place, and across age. Um, uh, due to things like environmental variability. So maybe some years, you know, recruitment will be super high. It'll, it'll spike because of a perfect storm of conditions. Um, sometimes natural mortality will be really high because there's a big predation event or a big heat wave. Um, and so if we, oftentimes in models, we assume that this, this value isn't deviating, but since it is, this will inherently create um, and introduce some sort of error. And, Ideally, we want to um, account for this amount of variability as much as possible, um, but also ensure that the model is still estimable. So if we add too much of this variability, we risk kind of overfitting it and, and not arriving at really important um, or meaningful values that we can use to make those predictions into the future and make good estimates of, of abundance. Uh, the other sub-model, the observation model, um, also has its amount of, of variability um, and, and kind of error. And this can ar arise from uh, different sources entirely. So we can have things like um, errors in the physical measurements. So maybe our scales or something are not as precise as, as we want them to be. Uh, we can deviate from assumed random sampling. So instead of you know, taking a truly random sample from the population for our indices, we might be um, unintentionally targeting you know, schools of fish that might all have similar ages or all might be more identical than uh, would be ex expected from just purely random sampling. Um, there's also uh, misreporting, so one fish could be misattributed to one species um, instead of the other, and just the model itself could be um, erroneous in, in such a way that it assumes some sort of distribution or some sort of structure that does not actually line up with reality and is causing this um, amount of error. Um, we try to account for this, um, these sources of observation error when we build specific likelihood functions and when we say that you know, we're drawing what we're actually observing from a known distribution. Um, and we want to account for this in um, um, our models as well to better reflect reality. Um, and you might be saying or starting to think to yourself, it's like these two things, they might be very confounded. It's like if you if you have your data, how much do you know is coming from this variability in these processes and how much is coming from this um, error and in, in how we're making our measurements? And you'd be right to be starting to speculate about that. And for um, for years, the options just seem to be either uh, treat to, to treat one or the other as as fixed um, or known, and estimate the other. And so um, traditionally, things like the statistical catch of age model, we'd assume that there's very no um, very little or no uh, parameter variability. Uh, maybe sometimes we'd say there's variability in recruitment, but for the most part, we'd say things like um, fishing mortality or selectivity or catchability is, is the same over time. But we'd say that um, we what we're observing, these measurements of, of catch at age are um, measured imperfectly. And so all of that variability, how it's not matching up is, become, is, is a result of this observation error and not of the process variation. Um, on the flip side of this, uh, traditionally we've been able 
uh, to employ virtual population analysis, which is it's the converse. So it says that there is year and age specific values like mortality and recruitment, but that um, the what we're measuring is is 100 is accurate. It, it matches up to to reality, and so we have these perfect measures of of catch at age. Um, and so what state space stock assessment modeling kind of offers us is this third option, this happy medium where theoretically we can account for both the process variation and the observation error. So we can have these year and age specific uh, values of things like mortality and recruitment um, while also accounting for the fact that we, can, we can't perfectly um, measure the system. And it can do this by, um, uh, uh, by a specific way that it explicitly sets out the um, time series models. And so uh, time for a few equations. Um, the, the way that these uh, time series models are set up is these sort of Markovian um, stepwise processes. So it says that um, your, your process model, your population model is such that um, the value at a given time in your, your unobserved state, something like your abundance or um, mortality, is a function of the state immediately previous um, in the time series and some amount of error. And that, by contrast, the observation model is, um, so your, your uh, kind of your catch data, your um, composition data, your, your indices are, are a function just of the state at a given time and um, its own source of error. And that these two error terms, this um, uh, VT and this epsilon T um, have kind of specified pre-described error distributions and that the variance, so the variability around the error, say like the amount that mortality is varying over time or the amount that the observation um, is deviating from reality is, is either can be estimated, so that amount of variability can be estimated or um, is fixed in the model. And in theory, we should be able to estimate both. Um, just to, to restate this in terms of graphics and not, um, equations, what the your basic state space framework would look like is, is this. So you have uh, your state, and in this case, state can be um, all the values, recruitment, mortality, abundance, uh, in a given year, um, uh, determines the state in the next year plus some amount of error, and that the observation in a given year um, is dependent on just the state in one year and plus its own source of error. And um, when we take this um, state space framework and we map a stock assessment model onto it, it would look something like this, um, as I've been describing. So um, these sorts of um, values, these underlying states that we can never actually observe in a system are um, dependent on one another in this very fixed and formalized way, and that the um, uh, observations are being drawn just from values in a given year. So rather than a time series of catch, we're we're saying that there is a um, a time series, like a, an interdependent time series of these underlying values that we are trying to estimate. Um, and in theory, by being able by uh, being able to do this, we're able to introduce way more um, for sources of process error than we traditionally would for like a statistical catch at age model um, in things like uh, mortality. Um, which we know just biologically uh, was necessarily changing over time. And we want to be able to um, reflect that. And in theory, by having this um, structure in place, we should be able to er estimate both these kinds of errors and their variances. And so the biggest advantages of the, um, the state space uh, structure for a, a stock assessment model is things like greater stochasticity, so greater amounts of, of, of randomness or variation in this population model. Um, studies have shown that using this formulation creates less retrospective bias. So in this figure here, um, this is a, a, a retrospective plot. So what we do is we take um, final year, the final year of information and we move it from the data set and we rerun the model and see what that does to the estimation. So in this case, it's something like abundance and how it trends over time across years. Um, and if you remove the final year or you remove the final two years or the final three years, you essentially peel back these layers and you start to see what, what an individual year of data um, does to the estimates for the entire time series. 
And you get plots like these that show that, you know, if we only evaluate up to 25 years, uh, the abundance in year 20 is quite different from um, if you had extra extra years of data. And studies have shown that um, with the state-based formulation uh, and because of what you're kind of assuming in this, uh, this hierarchical process, that uh, some of this bias is less and that the deviations are, are not as bad. Um, the state-based structure does accommodate years of missing data as well because of this uh, kind of stepwise underlying um, um, model. So if you have a missing year of, of abundance information, you just say, well, that's one link in the chain and we can kind of estimate what's going on with the, the missing link, uh, even if we don't have available data um, for that year. And studies have also shown that state say stock assessment modeling have facilitated uh, better prediction. So when you're actually forecasting into the future, um, you found that the, the estimates are, are a bit better for that. Um, disadvantages, however, of the state space stock assessment modeling uh, framework um, is uh, high computational demands, which I'll get into um, a little bit more later, um, higher uncertainty. So uh, when you do get your parameter estimation, sometimes the amount of error can be much higher. And uh, we often run into convergence difficulty when you set it up uh, this way. Uh, the asterisk is included, though, because as it's been pointed out to me that higher uncertainty might not necessarily be a bad thing. So we might actually need to add that one to, to the advantages because higher uncertainty might be accurately reflecting the amount of um, uncertainty in a system. And if we um, uh, if we have low uncertainty, that might be saying that actually the estimates aren't very good because it's, it's too narrow and it's not accounting for um, what might actually be happening. So, um, but we didn't get to kind of where we are with um, state-based stock assessment modeling overnight. And we didn't kind of come to this, um, uh, the models that we have today, despite having this sort of framework of, of state-based modeling in the back of our minds for, for many years. Um, and actually depending on um, your, your true definition of a um, state-based stock assessment model, we've been using them in one form or another for almost 40 years. Um, if we do just define it as uh, a model that accounts for both process error and observation error, the earliest models for this were um, in the, the stock assessment um, literature can be found in the early 80s, um, as early as like Fournier and Archibald, who just built a model that has stochasticity in the data and some time and age varying um, mortality. Um, if, you, if you narrow the definition um, just a little bit more to one where the process error is in this unobserved and explicit kind of Markovian uh, time series that's based on this like one step ahead. Um, it was folks in the late 80s and early 90s that were first uh, pursuing this. So Mendelssohn and Sullivan and Goodmanson is often um, cited as the, as the first example of a, a state space stock assessment model. And narrowing it even further into a, um, a model that has this unknown process error and that there are explicitly kind of specified and, and fully integrated out of, of your joint likelihood. Um, this kind of wasn't fully implemented until the, the early to mid aughts. Um, and this was um, facilitated by um, advances in computation that just weren't, um, weren't feasible in, in the, the 80s and the 90s. And so specifically, you know, what, what do I mean by this, um, the joint likelihood and, and marginal likelihood? Um, and, and approximation. So um, what we want to be able to do with one of the, the key things that we want to accomplish with, with state space modeling is to integrate out the process errors and be able to estimate the variances. And so sort of a, a progressively more statistically complex and advanced series of, um, of techniques that we're able to kind of facilitate um, us being able to do this. And so this kind of first generation of, of state space um, stock assessment models used the, the Kalman filter and the extended Kalman filter to um, kind of approximate this uh, complicated um, integral that, uh, that could facilitate this estimation. Um, later on, uh, folks used Monte Carlo methods uh, to make this sort of uh, integration possible. And then finally, kind of the third generation and, and what we've been pursuing today is using the Laplace approximation, which is easily accomplished in AD model builder and now in, in template model builder um, to, to integrate out process errors. And, and the goal progressively, and as, I, as these models got more advanced and um, more complicated, the, the goal was to estimate or approximate 
we call this true marginal likelihood as opposed to a, a joint um, errors in variables um, likelihood. So what, what do I mean more specifically um, by, by that? Um, your joint likelihood and your marginal likelihood. So just take a little deviation into um, likelihood theory world here. Um, so for the notation, if we have uh, if yt is a vector or array of, of all those observations that you know the catch the indices, um, xt is the vector um, of all of all of the states, things like your abundance and your mortality by year, and and theta here is the parameters of the process and observation um, submodels. Um, the joint likelihood is uh, which we're trying to maximize over to find the the most likely set of, of parameters. A joint likelihood is is saying well. Let's look at all of the possible um, parameter values and all the possible state values. So we want to maximize this um, to find the most likely of these uh, to explain our, our observed data, um, our catch. Um, though in reality, we only want to be maximizing over the parameters, not the states, because we don't want to treat the states like parameters because they actually aren't. And so um, this likelihood here, the joint likelihood, is the probability of a series of states and the observations um, from those states. Um, however, because the likelihood shouldn't depend on the states, we need to integrate out over all possible states. And that's why we have something like the marginal likelihood. So it's the likelihood of just the parameters given the set of observations, completely removing the effect of, of the states on, on what we're trying to maximize. But this requires, unlike the joint likelihood, this requires this integration, which as you can imagine, we consider this is, this is an array or this is a, um, Oh, this is an array or a vector across um, all time points. If you have you know, 30 years of, of data and if you only have a single thing that's, that's varying, uh, it still means a 30 dimensional uh, integral here. Um, and so it's these techniques, this um, uh, the Kalman filter, the, the Monte Carlo and the, the Kalman, it's, uh, sorry, and the Laplace approximation that's trying to approximate this integral such that we're actually able to estimate it and not um, uh, and not risk um, like these massive amounts of computational demands. Um, so to kind of do it this, in this timely way and in, in this realistic way. And so it's only once we were kind of able to um, uh, achieve that, that this like more renaissance of, um, uh, of state-based stock assessment modeling was made possible. And I'll just make a final note here. It's kind of beyond the scope of, of my talk, but everything I've talked about uh, to this point is based on uh, frequentist statistics. And there, there's an entire kind of area uh, of state-space stock assessment modeling that looks at uh, a Bayesian framework for uh, for estimation, looking at the, the posterior density rather than, than the likelihood. Um, and this has been pursued by um, a lot of folks in the state-space stock assessment world um, using uh, STAN. And so, you know, I think now we're at kind of a, a third generation or fourth generation of, of state-based stock assessment modeling, to, depending on who you ask and depending on what your focus was. Uh, but kind of today, what we call state-based modeling um, is, is become kind of synonymous with this integrated marginal likelihood as opposed to this joint likelihood. Now that we have um, the, the software that can easily facilitate doing these high-level integrals, it's like that's the only definition. Um, the, the focus now is turned from can we do it to what can we do with it? And so as opposed to like is, is state-based access modeling possible, now that we kind of have the, um, the, the footing in place that we've been able to build on top of that and, and pursue these things that, that have been focuses of, of all of stock assessment modeling, not just the state-based world, but now we're seeing if because of the, the state-based structure, um, it's, it's more possible, it's more feasible. So this is things like um, natural mortality estimation. Um, say we just had a, a CAPM workshop just focusing on natural mortality. It's, uh, it would be really great if we, could, if we could estimate that within the models instead of um, fixing it from outside or, or just assuming it because it can have great influences on um, our, our model output. And um, ideally, you know, we, we think um, natural mortality might be we definitely know it varies by age um, and whether it varies by years is still kind of um, debated and uh, can be dependent on a lot of things, but we'd love to be able to estimate natural mortality. and We'd love to be able to have some process error around natural mortality, but it's still kind of in discussion. Um, 
the models now that are being explored today, the, the state-based access models, um, also research has gone into uh, multi-species models, multi-fleet models, and there's a huge sub area of the field that's focused just on um, what's the best kind of observation model for this. And so when we assume um, our observed data is coming from um, the, the real values plus some amount of, of error, it's like, what, what do we think that that error is, is structured as? And so there's been a lot of talk into alternative likelihoods, which can drive a lot of um, uh, data weighting. And that's another question that kind of comes into that. It's like, well, do we fit better to some kinds of data or other kinds of data? Um, that's still an area uh, of rich uh, research. Um, what I've noticed, though, is that this kind of third or fourth generation, um, the it, researchers have kind of all been pursuing um, a, a similar experiment uh, kind of in isolation and across the world. And it's been to uh, to kind of take existing stock assessment models, build a state space version of that stock assessment model, compare it to the status quo, and then test it using simulation. Um, so what's come out of this uh, kind of once we had the footing, uh, you know, there was like, a, like as I said, this renaissance of um, state space stock assessment modeling uh, research. Um, I, I put I emphasize and italicize here some relevant publications because I absolutely do not want to leave out um, uh, anybody um, who's who's also contributed to this field. Um, I know uh, Dr. Peralt is probably is on this call. I saw her as well and. Um, definitely should have included uh, some of her work as well, working with uh, Dr. Cadigan up in um, Canada, but it, it's folks from all across the world. It's um, uh, mostly focused in European stocks and ICs, so folks in um, uh, Sweden and Denmark and Norway, folks on the East Coast of the United States and Canada. Um, and uh, all of this kind of culminated into a really fortuitous meeting of the minds in, in Copenhagen in uh, January of 2020, right before, you know, the world kind of fractured all of us and kind of prevented our coming together. But there was a workshop on the review and future of state based stock assessment models. And um, the official picture is here, but I also, you know, want to say our Canadian colleagues, unfortunately, were unable to make it uh, to that event because of um, ice storms and uh, travel conditions that made it impossible. But they, they just kind of got a um, an introduction into what would uh, become very commonplace for the rest of us is like remote learning and, and remote conversation. Um, but uh, in addition to all these, uh, this research and these pursuits that I mentioned into multi-fleet models, multi-species models, um, there's really been um, two main software packages that have come out of it using the, uh, the template model builder um, framework. And that's something called stock, uh, there, I apologize, there's an error in this. That should be just a state space assessment model um, or SAM and the Woods Hole assessment model or WAM, which if you all are uh, frequent attendees to this uh, seminar series would have heard discussion of uh, back in October. Um, and so I'll briefly kind of cover what, since these have become such important um, software pieces and will likely be um, what people use uh, going forward if they want a, a ready-made um, state-space modeling um, package to, to kind of pursue their state-space stock assessment needs. Um, I'll just briefly kind of touch on, on the features and, and the assumptions of these two um, different models, of these two softwares. Um, so the, the SAM model, um, the process assumes that the abundance is the function of the abundance of the previous time step um, minus you know, the uh, the loss due to fishing and natural mortality, plus some amount of, of process error called like the survivorship error. Um, recruitment also follows its own uh, sort of random walk that can be tied to the, the abundance and that age specific fishing mortality. So at age and year follows a correlated random walk such that there's correlation between the ages and that the, um, the random walk progresses to, through time, but the similarity in that random walk can be uh, very similar to adjacent ages. So how the, the fishing mortality of age five individuals progresses over time might be similar, but not identical to how age six individuals, uh, their fishing mortality progresses over time. So it's the process model. The observation model assumes that the observed catch is a function of that which is predicted by a bearing off catch equation and a multivariate normal um, error. So again, having that sort of correlation across ages and that these models, um, by default, assume that there is a fisheries independent survey 
and that the index that's observed is a function of the abundance in a given year, um, the a catchability term for how the catchability of the survey, and multivariate normal error. Um, by contrast, the WAM model, which was being developed um, kind of in, in parallel, um, but still has some of the similar features, um, abundance is still a, a function of the abundance of the previous time, fishing and natural mortality, and some amount of like survivorship error. But and there's but rather than having recruitment as a random walk, um, there are several recruitment options. And uh, fishing mortality, instead of following a um, a random walk process over time. Um, is a function of selectivity and one uh, full yearly value of, of fishing mortality, so a yearly um, fishing mortality. Um, natural mortality, instead of just uh, being a single value uh, across time, is that there's some amount of process error that's being included in that. And there's several options for how it can be, um, it can include independent or, or correlated error. And then there's also a lot of flexibility and option for including environmental covariates into the, the process metal side of things. Um, the observation model um, is quite different as well and um, assumes that the total catch and the proportions at age could be modeled separately, though there are several options for age composition and, and proportions in the WAM model. And if anybody is watching this um, in the future, I would advise, so not today, present at uh, September uh, 2nd, um, I would encourage you to also go back into the archives and look at um, the discussion that Brian Stock gave on on WAM about, you know, five sessions ago. So he would do a much better job than me. I just gave really the broad overview, but he does a great job of, of explaining his his software. Um, I would also mention that uh, how I explained I'll go back one how I explained the the um, state space assessment model is. Uh, based on how it was um, explained in the the 2014 paper and the 2016 paper that describes it. And I think since then, um, a lot more options have been made available for things like different kinds of um, observation models and uh, different different options for, for both parts of these models. Um, but I say all this to kind of say that, you know, these these really advanced and really neat uh, software packages have been available for me um, to play around with or to use and to download. You know, both both groups of researchers have been really freely um, uh, made their their software freely available through through GitHub and the like. And even despite having this sort of um, these great things available to me, you know, with these built-in um, visualization packages and so on, um, I still just ended up. Kind of building my own, and so to mix some metaphors, the 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 line I like to say is, you know, I stood on the shoulders of giants, but I still just kind of reinvented the wheel. But um, it's in my defense, it's it's uh, what I was. It was not only kind of a way to, for me to. It was an exercise for me to actually learn template model builder because I didn't know anything about it. But um, our own needs in the Laurentian Great lakes um, are might be a little different from those that are used in the Atlantic and our specific um, data needs um, are, are considerably or our different data availability are are fairly different. Um, but like rather than you know utilize the, these two really great existing packages, um, I did those kind of the the three pronged experiment that that I said I've been seeing kind of across the world in the last 10 years. So I built a state space stock assessment model in TMB. Um, it had these additional options for for 2D autocorrelation. Um, I took the results of that model and I compared compared it against the the status quo model or the existing models that we were using in the Great Lakes, specifically um, a statistical catch and age model. And and I have and then I will in the future test um, the effectiveness of this model using um, things like simulations. I'm going to take a brief sip of. Liquid. Okay. Um, but so specifically, uh, as I kind of alluded to, there's there's unique features of the Great Lakes fisheries and our data that influence how I was able to build the model and some some limitations on um, how I could build it in a certain way that made it differ considerably from either SAM or WAM. Um, so just really beat it over your head with the visuals. I had fairly good, I would say, really good um, effort information. Um, on the fisheries, so like how many lines are being thrown, um, how many nets were being employed um, every single year um, uh, of interest. Um, but what I didn't have was a good survey. So there have been a handful of surveys 
um, and surveying efforts at the Great Lakes, but um, from what we could look at of the data, we just uh, weren't really confident that um, it was worth including that in, uh, in an assessment model, unlike uh, folks in, in Europe or um, in the uh, American at, in the you know North Atlantic region who have uh, really good and reliable surveys and are able to fit um, data to the information from those surveys. So to the brief background on um, kind of my area of interest, um, I look specifically at Lake Michigan, Lake Whitefish in a specific region, uh, the northmost region of Lake Michigan, um, for which I had 32 years of available data up until 2017. I'm sure there's been a few more. Uh, that's kind of when I started building this model. I think there's been a few years since and I need to kind of update it. Um, we assume that there's 12 distinct ages, so individuals uh, recruit to the fishery at age four and that and 15 onwards is considered a general plus group, um, and that there's two distinct fisheries within this region or different um, gear types. There's both a gill net and a trap net fishery. And as I alluded, we have uh, really good effort information. So how many um, you know, meters of line were employed or how many um, you know, hours of, of the trap net or uh, gill net were uh, kind of laid out um, the catch is reported in in terms of total weight, which then gets converted into um, total uh, numbers using an average um, weighted age kind of kind of table. Um, and this weighted age table and this age composition information um, is uh, is gathered opportunistically from from subsampling the data. And I say opportunistically to mean um, you know some years there's no information at all, and it's kind of when when folks are able to get out there, when they're able to get on the boats and, and take these subsamplings. So um, it's not kind of very directed and the amount of uh, data collection from year to year can, can vary considerably. Um, and what I ended up building based on the available data and, and the region and the, the needs of um, the folks around here is something that's neither SAM-like nor WAM-like, but a little bit um, actually in the middle and a little bit more similar to Kind of what folks in um, um, in Sweden are doing actually, but that's beyond the scope of, of this talk. And so what I ended up assuming was that um, the abundance at a give the log scale abundance um, at a given age in here is a function of the abundance in the previous age and previous year um, and the uh, the instantaneous mortality, but without an additional um, error term. So I say that this, that's completely deterministic, the abundance trend. Uh, but this um, instantaneous mortality is a function of a single natural mortality and um, fishing mortality, which uh, varies by gear type, by year, and by age. And that the fishing mortality, rather than following a trend or just being um, a function of previous years and, um, and error, uh, is actually a function of that really good effort data that we have. And uh, a catchability for the fishery. And so I was told to make that kind of a, a, a distinct specification as well, because I know um, catchability um, usually means catchability of the survey. In this case, it means catchability of, of the fishery itself. And it's that this catchability rather than the fishing mortality is the thing that's following this correlated random walk with these correlations through ages, uh, across ages, excuse me. Um, my observation error uh, is was kind of similar to um, one of the, the WAM model options. And so I said that the um, I am, I'm estimating the, the uh, predicted catch based on a, a Baranoff catch equation. Um, and then, so this would be the, uh, the predicted catch and the predicted proportions at age. And then I took those values and compared them against the observed uh, total catch and proportions at age by assuming the total catch was log normally distributed and the catch compositions follow a multinomial distribution. Um, so I kind of explained why how my model differed from either SAM or WAM. Well, how it differed from the uh, previously employed statistical catch at age model is that instead of recruitment following a stock recruitment curve, uh, or rather it's uh, just estimated val values which are penalized if they deviate from a stock recruitment curve, I said that the log scale recruitment was following um, a random walk such that the, the value in the next year, um, in, a, in a given year is a function of the, the previous, the value in the previous year and error. And I said, as I, as I mentioned in the previous slide, that the age specific logic catchability um, is the thing that's um, following this random walk with multivariate normal error. 
whereas previously in the statistical catch age model, it was modeled as a separability function, such that fishing mortality at age and year was a function of uh, a common, um, well, selectivity curve that was varying a little over time and um, a catchability that was varying over time rather than, so instead of having this um, selectivity and year effect, um, it's it's following this more, more flexible framework. Um, and then uh, kind of the hallmark, the big thing, the big advantage of, of state safe stock assessment modeling is that you can estimate the process error variance rather than having it fixed and that you can explicitly kind of estimate this amount of, of process error and this observation error. And I um, could be able to do this, estimate the process error variance um, by integrating it out of the likelihood using the marginal likelihood instead of any sort of joint likelihood. So how well did I model do? How well did it differ? Well, um, for this um, image and for all subsequent images, the status quo previous model, um, the statistical catch age model, will be indicated by a solid black line. And the state space doc assessment model, um, the new one that I built, uh, will be indicated by a dashed blue line. And this diagram shows the estimated uh, spawning stock biomass in this region um, across all of the years. And I was pleasantly um, happy to see, <laughs> not surprised, I guess I wasn't, ex I didn't have any preconceived ideas, but I, I was happy to see that um, for the most part, both models uh, estimate similar trends over time, despite the state-based model estimating slightly higher spawning stock biomass across time, especially towards the, the tail end of the time series in the last few years, it in fact estimates kind of a, an increase in biomass rather than um, staying the same. Um, I noted a similar relationship in recruitment. And so this is recruitment in number of fish um, for all of the years. Again, both models are showing uh, very similar trends. And with the statistical catch and age model um, showing uh, a little more increase and a little more difference um, at the tail end and a little bit more of a different trend at, at the end of the time series. Um, this plot shows the uh, mortality. So from bottom to top, this is the instantaneous natural mortality the instantaneous fishing mortality due to the trap net and the instantaneous natural mortality from the gill net on both plots. Um, it's, uh, it's rather difficult to sort of map these right on top of each other or to show it distinctly, but um, I hope uh, to kind of illustrate that, again, the, the story seems to be that most, both models are following similar trends with uh, over time and capturing the same kind of variability, but um, uh, with slightly different total estimated values. And I was really pleased to see this actually given um, uh, the differences that we noticed in the catchability. So um, these are four plots for uh, catchability um, uh, in terms of either millions of feet times year or hundreds of lifts times year, which is just sometimes the catchability has kind of silly units based on how it's used in the, in the models. Um, uh, for the statistical catch and age model in the gill net fishery, statistical catch and age model, trap net, and for each in the uh, state space stock assessment model. Um, what I noticed was that for the, the conventional, the status quo models, um, the highest catchability seemed to occur at the oldest ages. So each of these lines is a different age and how it's trending um, over all of the years. Um, and that age 15 or 14 consistently had um, the highest catchability in the status quo catch age models, whereas it was these intermediate ages, nine and 10, that seemed to have the highest catchability in the statistical, or sorry, in the um, state city stock assessment models. Um, that was, yeah, I, I think this was, this surprised me. And it especially um, surprised me that the fishing mortality would have such similar metrics based on, on this difference. But um, this kind of, these results also do sort of make sense based on um, in the statistical catch and age model, we forced in an asymptotic relationship for the selectivity, whereas we allowed the model, um, the, the state space model to have this sort of flexibility. And when it had that amount of flexibility, it said, well, we weren't catching older ages. We were just catching these intermediate ages. Um, it was also, as you can kind of see, adjacent ages have uh, kind of similar trends. And that's what I was sort of alluding to. The, when the model estimated the amount of, of correlation um, between these uh, different um, random walks for different ages, and it estimated pretty high correlation so that the random walk over time for age four will be very similar to age five, little less similar 
to age six to age seven and so on and so we're kind of seeing this uh, this linkage which uh, is realistic it adds a, some level of flexibility but it can kind of lead to these very different sorts of outcomes um, final plot i'll show is a sort of the fitting plot so the solid line here is the observed harvest of the gillnet and the trap net fishery over time the dotted uh, red line is the estimated value for the statistical catch and age model and the blue dotted line is um, the estimated value for the state space model and I was very happy to see that both of them um, were fitting the the observations fairly well. So I don't think it's a, an issue of one of them um, differing kind of considerably or having much more observation error. They're both fitting um, rather nicely. So it's the part where I say that you know I have some some model shortcomings and, and some things that might explain some of these differences because of uh, things I wasn't able to do that I really wanted to do with this model. Um, like I said, when I when I gave it this added flexibility, it was it was estimating these very different patterns of, of selectivity slash um, catchability. I, I call it this age and year specific catchability, but you can kind of it's a pseudo selectivity if you just look at it in a single year. Um, arguably, it's it's kind of unrealistic to say that older ages are not susceptible to fishery to, to assume that there's this dome shaped um, selectivity instead of an asymptotic one, because we have no reason to think why older ages wouldn't be susceptible to a gill net or a trap net based on how those devices those work. And so um, I'll be looking a little more into that and trying to see maybe if I need to kind of impose a different structure, though I risk kind of removing some of this flexibility that the model had to, to estimate the dynamics of the flexibility and catchability without those constraints. Um, I had to place a pretty strong prior on natural mortality. You know, the dream is to, to be able to estimate it within model and not have to read out other information because you want the model to kind of figure that out organically. Uh, just wasn't able to do that. Put a really strong, uh, maybe not prior, but strong penalty on on how, what the natural mortality should should be uh, estimated at. And I'm definitely far off from time and age variance uh, natural mortality, though there's plenty of other folks who've been very successful in this. Um, uh, I wasn't able to estimate the observation error variance after all. And so when I when I specify that, you know, the total catch that I'm observing is deviating from using a, a log normal distribution with kind of um, uh, an amount of standard deviation or variance that could be estimated, um, you know, I tried that and the model just wouldn't converge, wouldn't run. It had convergence issues, like I said, one of the, the big disadvantages of these models. And so I ended up having to fix it at, um, at the value that was used for the the status quo model for this just catch at age model um and it ended up fitting the model very closely because i had this really narrow um sort of variability and when i kind of relaxed that i also ran into issues so when i told it it didn't have to fit the model or fit the observations as well that also ran into problems the other thing i had the other component of the observation error that i had to fix instead of estimate was um, effective sample sizes so I said those proportions at age were fit using a multinomial um, distribution. And the, the main way that we show the, the, the power of that data or the weight that we should attribute to that data is through this um, effective sample size. So we say that you know, what you're actually sampling isn't a reflection of, of true um, uh, unbiased sampling. And so we, we kind of scale down the effective sample size to tell the model, you know, don't you know, fit maybe the catches better than the proportions. Um, and ideally, I would want the model to be able to figure out that weighting between the two um, data uh, sets itself, but ultimately was unable to do that. Um, and really, these shortcomings became very apparent when I moved into that third stage of um, kind of the experimental process that I've been describing, the, you know, the build, compare, test. Um, when I moved into the testing phase and tried to fit data uh, where I had uh, generated these proportions at AIDS using the multinomial, it, uh, things were uh, really goofy there and I think I have somewhat of an idea of why, what might be going on there um, and so the two references I threw up here is kind of the the background that I, I was using um, to to estimate these uh, effective sample sizes and so in the in the conventional model we do this iterative reweighting process um, originally um, explained by by Francis in some early 2000s papers or sorry 2010s uh, papers um, where you you use the the real sample size, you run the model, and you kind of iteratively um, keep adjusting the effective sample size lower and lower until the observed and expected variances 
uh, match. And this was more detailed described for our, our Great Lakes systems uh, by Truesdale um, and all back in 2017. Um, when I attempted to do this sort of iterative reweighting process using the, um, uh, the state space model, uh, it absolutely did not work. And actually the reweighting would end up making the effective sample size way higher than the real sample size. So this just iterative reweighting doesn't really work um, when it can't, when you don't give the model, um, uh, when you allow it this sort of the process variability, uh, it can't internally evaluate the, the information content of this data. And so if we did want to let these models figure, figure out the observation error, figure out how much weight should be given to different kinds of data, um, another observation model might, might be needed. But lucky for me, that is a very lucrative, very uh, rich area of investigation right now in the state space stock assessment world. And so specifically the same folks who, um, who built and are using um, SAM, SAM, um, are, have been pursuing this, this question in quite a lot of detail. Um, so there, and I do believe that their model now has a lot of these options available um, for different likelihood structures. And so for assuming things like the multivariate normal versus the multinomial and so on and so forth. Um, several options available, but of course each has their own unique advantages and disadvantages. Um, the main ones being like some uh, of these formulations can allow for zeros in the data, some can't. Some increase the number of parameters you have to estimate, some don't do that quite as, as much, and some can account for correlation and, and some can't. And so um, I think there's a great line from, from the paper itself that I wanted to reproduce here that summarizes it better than I ever could. It said, the best choice of observational likelihood differs for different stocks. And the choice is important for short-term conclusions drawn from the assessment model. And so kind of the best approach might be to kind of play around with the different um, uh, kinds of likelihood, see uh, likelihood formulations, see what that does to your results and see if that's that's important to you and if it, if it changes things up uh, quite considerably. Um, so that's sort of recommendation number one um, is, to, is to keep playing around with that. Um, my other recommendations uh, might be that for these theoretical advantages of state space stock assessment models to be achieved, so those like those estimations of the variances, we might have to um, use specific um, likelihood formulations to get at that. You know, I've seen that the, the way SAM and WAM are structured um, kind of can account for that and those models have been working. Uh, very well in, in a way that mine has not. So that might be, and with some further testing, I might be able to find out if, you know, that is an absolute necessity for these state-based stock assessment models to work. Um, I would just recommend, you know, for anyone currently working on it or anyone thinking about wanting to work on state-based models, you know, this system of of building a model, comparing it against the status quo, and and testing its dynamics is is great. And I think uh, the more people do that, the more kind of work that gets done in that area, you know, the more information we'll learn about um, the limitations or the possibilities of, of state space stock assessment models. So I'd say uh, try those alternative likelihood models, um, or those observation models with those different likelihood functions and test the, er the limits of being able to estimate process error. You know, I was able to estimate uh, time varying um, and age varying catchability, um, a random walk for the recruitment, but, you know, the dream is also being able to estimate that that natural mortality and how we're going to do that, um, TBD. So, and finally, the final recommendation comes from one of the earliest stock assessment, or earliest state space stock assessment model, depending on your definition. And I, I found this line when I was kind of doing my history research and preparation preparation for this talk, and I loved it so much. I, I had to find a way to put it somewhere, um, and it's that a model should not be regarded as a final finished product, but rather as a flexible framework which can always be modified should the situation requirement. And if nothing else, um, if you learn nothing specifically about states-based models and, and how they work specifically today, I just really want to reiterate the idea that, you know, the model depends on your data. If you don't have certain kinds of data, you can't formulate a model a certain way. In my case, you know, no survey data means I couldn't include that as this fisheries independent index. Um, and I had to kind of work around that. Unfortunately, I had this good effort data in order to drive that. And so any model that we build will be dependent on the information we have, not the other way around. And we should just kind of continue to treat these as living, adaptable, breathing sort of um, sort of formulations. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for um, your attention um, and your time. Uh, thank you to um, 
all of my, my funding agencies again, and I will leave up my contact information here while I take any questions. Um, and also you, these, these slides are uh, made available in a PDF format. And at the tail end, I've included the long list of um, citations that I could not fit into a single slide back in the middle. So please, please have a look at those um, and credit where credit is due to all the great folks who've been with us for the last you know, 40 years standing on the shoulder of giants so absolutely Thanks, thank you so much emily that was wonderful and yes i just just emily mentioned uh her her um there's a handout link on your toolbox and you can go ahead and download her slides and i think they're very interesting i love those sources so um thanks again for the presentation we have about five minutes for questions so please type your questions into the questions chat box and i'll read them to emily and um, before I do that, I also want to encourage you to share the recording of this webinar with interested colleagues. Um, I'm going to upload it later on today to the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel. I put the link in the chat box as well. It's, I think it's under your questions chat box. So please uh, let people know about this really, really fabulous presentation. So let me go into the questions and see if we have any. Uh, let's see. Not yet. Excellent. It takes a second to uh, receive pe people's questions. Um, and actually, while we're waiting, I do want to mention that we have an extra stock assessment seminar this month on Thursday, September 23rd, also at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, the webinar is titled The Fisheries Integrated Modeling System, a new modular paradigm for fisheries stock assessment software. And uh, we will be uh, Put it, uploading the registration in the next day or so. So I hope you'll join us. All right, so we're starting to get some questions. Uh, one is a compliment, great job. I agree, Emily. <laughs> um, <laughs> this next question asks, um, I have a question about bias correction. I'm not sure how much Sam has explored, but in WAM, I think they've explored whether slash how to do bias correction for log normal recruitment. But it becomes more complicated when including other process errors where we don't care about having mean unbiased estimators. Have you explored log normal bias correction? No, I haven't. And that's actually, as I was kind of going through all these documents and um, looking through the history and such, I saw that um, WAM does explicitly say that, you know, what, if you're just saying that it's from a log normal distribution of the predicted catch, it can sometimes, it's like, um, it can be biased and you can in, you can include the bias correction by doing, I think it's like divided by um, sigma squared um, or or something. I'd, I'd definitely reference the 2021 paper for a full explanation of that. They're saying like that it's not like the, the distribution isn't being just drawn from um, the predicted uh, catch and just sigma squared. It's like there is a bias correction in that component. Um, it's a part that I haven't included yet, and I always forget about the sort of the mean bias, median bias. If you're actually showing the the mean or median, um, and I have to, the the actual answer to your question is no, I haven't looked into that yet um, in my own models. But uh, it's been become it's been brought to my attention, and it's increasingly clear that that uh, can be a problem and, and is a problem, and that I should see at least I should see what happens to my results when I do make that that bias correction. Thank you, Emily. Uh, there's a second question here. It says, you jump from SCAA to state space, but didn't talk about integrated analysis models with penalized fixed effects. Yeah, so I guess that's the, the, the error, errors in variable likelihood or uh, joint likelihood uh, is often, I, I kind of consider that synonymous, though I know it's not quite the same as sort of like your penalized approach. So you could say like your likelihood is you know the likelihood of observing your data given the set of uh, parameters and then you can like add components or multiply components to the likelihood to say like well also while you're fitting that make sure you minimize the amount of error around um something like deviations in in recruitment um i think that's that's sort of the errors and variable approach i didn't you're right i didn't include that specifically as a kind of a step in the history process, but um, 
that is a kind of an important part from getting from kind of the conventional the statistical cache and age models to this full integrated um, likelihood that we see today. So thank you, whoever pointed that out. Um, there was a joke that I had in the, the talk that I, I kind of took out, but maybe I should add back in. It's like, you know, I don't know if we're on the third or fourth generation because, you know, history was my absolute worst subject in, in high school and, and in college. And so there's definitely a reason that even though I was an Asian studies major and study a lot of history that I'm not in that field anymore because I am very much not good at history at all. So yeah, in the revision of this model I or this presentation, I definitely include that as a step in the timeline. Excellent. Um, this will be our last question since we're hitting the hour. Uh, this last question asks, you mentioned one of the differences between state space and catch at age models is the magnitude of estimated uncertainty. Did you see large differences between estimates of uncertainty between your state space lake whitefish model and the SCAA model? Yes, I did. So short answer is yes. Uh, often, sometimes it was harder to um, look at that amount of variability around parameters because because the meaning of parameters differed considerably in the two models. It's like um, I had whole parameters that didn't exist in one or the other, like selectivity terms and uh, stock recruitment terms. So it was hard to say explicitly, like this one estimates, you know, this second model estimates higher uncertainty in this specific value. But in things like derived quantities, like, um, and things that are states in the state space model, um, I did notice um, larger variability around uh, those, those derived estimates. And so what the model does is it, it finds the most likely set of parameters and then it says, well, what's the, um, what's the most likely set of states based on those parameters? So it's kind of like an after step. Um, so the interpretation is a little different, um, but yes, for the most part, I saw a little bit of a wider uh, margin. So the confidence of interval uh, was a bit higher. Thank you. So that last that concludes our webinar. I want to thank you so much, Emily, for joining us today and being uh, with us um, in, in our seminars over time. And uh, also to Kristen for organizing the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series, which is wonderful. And to you, audience, I'm glad you joined us today for today's seminar. NOAA Central Library is proud to present the work of the NOAA community and its partners like Emily. And we hope you'll join us again for another Stock Assessment Science Seminar. Uh, hopefully we'll see you on the 23rd. So take care and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.